Greetings and welcome to Office Hours. If you are new here or you're watching on YouTube and you want to learn a little bit more about what we do, head over to officehours.global. You'll get the schedule and also be able to watch past episodes. Now, our first hour is typically we answer your questions on media and virtual production. Our second hour is something that we want to spend a little bit more time on. And today we'll be talking about working with high profile talent. So you want to stay tuned for that and feel free producers to submit your questions for the first First hour or the second hour, and we look forward to getting to them. All right, Bill, let's get this party started. Absolutely, Liberty. Good morning. And our first one comes in from Stan Chan in San Francisco, California. And Stan asks, is there a noticeable difference between using full NDI versus SDI, especially if an input stream already has compression applied? Oh, where's Guy when we when we need him? Our NDI experts on Absolutely. the on the panel. Man, I'm looking through it. I don't know if I know nothing about this topic, so I can't help you at all here. Sorry. So, Stan, what we will have to do is one, I encourage you to ping Guy and Discord and see if he can answer that question and or um, bring that back for later on in the week. And we'll see if we can we can get someone to help you with that. Next question. Moving on, the next question comes from Matt Wood in Newcastle Blown Time in the Tyne in the UK. Would it be possible to make a portable? office hours standard setup driven by an iPad? And if so, how? Go ahead, John Wallace. Um, you can't plug in a webcam into an iPad, so that's what really makes it difficult. You could technically plug in a USB mic into an iPad and, and probably have a decent experience, as long as you would have some kind of external control over that microphone. I don't know that any of like the MV7s uh, would allow any of the access that you would normally have connected to a PC, connected to the iPad. Uh, but you could definitely get decent audio and I would say maybe acceptable video out of an iPad. I haven't used the front camera in a while, but uh, definitely on the phones, they look fine. I just don't know what their quality is versus what we're doing here or versus a Brio. Go ahead, Nigel. I might try this later in the week when I'm doing some traveling. Uh, I think the iPad Pro would probably be the better answer. I probably wouldn't use the front-facing camera. I'd probably use the real camera, not the front-facing camera, which might provide some uh, challenges to you. I think audio is pretty easy. I think a pair of uh, AirPods or something will give you the audio. I think for a mic, if you have the Pro, you can use USB-C, get something like a Paulson uh, microphone and plug that into the USB-C. And I might guess that would be the easiest way of doing it. I don't know how flexible it would be. It'd be much easier to do from a Mac or something, from a, a you know MacBook. And Bill? Yeah, I know iPads, particularly the Pro line, are moving toward USB-C rather than lightning connectors. The The issue, as everybody's indicating, is getting video uh, in and out of it successfully. And I don't know whether they'll ever change uh, iPad or Pad OS, whatever the uh, operating system is, uh, tablet OS, <laughs> to allow video in and out. If they did, it would be a great little setup because they're certainly getting powerful enough to handle this kind of signal flow. But I think that the connection is the problem now. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, look up on YouTube to find a green screen guy. And uh, here's a quick shot of uh, what he looks like. He takes this setup to uh, ball games and things. He has a portable green screen mounted to him with that laptop in front of his face and a good microphone. And uh, he comes into Zoom meetings that way. And he actually walks around while he's doing uh, his green screen stuff. So uh, it is possible. Look at his setup that he has there. Was that an iPad, though, or a full a laptop mount? It was a laptop. His, it's yeah. a laptop, and I think he uses a cell phone for his connectivity uh, to the laptop. And then he has a camera and a microphone and green screen all attached to him around his waist. I mean, walk around and put any background he wants in. This is the second time you've mentioned him, Courtney, so I'm going to look him up. I actually, Matt, I'm happy you asked this question because constantly when I'm going back and forth, I always wonder, can I do something much simpler than carrying around so much equipment? And I've got an M1 um, iPad. I haven't tried it yet, but I'm pretty confident. This is not the dongle. This is um, a converter so that it has an HDMI and a USB port. So I am curious if I, and I might test this in after hours, if I put this into the, you know, into the USB-C port, if I'd be able to, you know, get all the functionality and bring it into an ATEM. This is me just throwing that out there. I will test it, but thank you uh, for, for asking this question. Alex? 
It's really interesting. I hadn't thought about doing USB-C either um, from a USB-C based cam um, web camera or the ATEM. So that'd be a really interesting thing to see. I just don't know if, yeah, I think Zoom is built to just see the webcam, you know, in, in the iOS device. Um, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm 80% I'm sure that, that it's not going it, to, the, the, the video input into Zoom needs to be the camera. Now the camera on the new, the newest iPad may be good enough to, to, to do this for now. Um, but, uh, but I think that in the future, it probably wouldn't be enough. John Wallace? What I saw when I was looking this up earlier was that nothing supports UBC on the iPad OS. And so that's mm. your biggest issue is once they extend that uh, universal uh, video uh, into the driver or to the um, uh, kernel, then you could start seeing people leveraging different devices uh, for video in, which would be great to see, honestly. And Peter? The only comment I make about using the uh, the dongle you have for your uh, iPad Liberty is that USB-C port is really there so you can continue to power your iPad. And so if you use it for something else, you are limited by your battery and how fast it will drain. Good, good point. That's why I typically, and there's actually another dongle that I um, bought. I cannot remember the name. Hopefully I'll find it after and put it in maybe Discord that I use that has multiple ports on it. So I'm just also curious. Is, and I'm, I constantly keep power for that very reason of knowing that it is, you know, if you don't have power connected, that it would drain your battery, battery very quickly. Bill? Well, I was just saying on that wide connector you just showed, I think one of the ports might be another USB-C or yeah, I know in Lightning. So yeah, you could you could feed it power and still get those ports if it's connected to be able to do that. I don't know whether design makes it possible, but often those little dongles have a power port to keep it from battery draining too badly. Right. Well, it looks like we've got a great lab or at least a test to do in after hours. Next question. Next one come to us from Douglas Carmichael. What would be the entry level capture device for the Mac to enable capturing and enhancing VHS video for distribution on YouTube? Go ahead, Peter. Well, having tried this, um, I know that the Blackmagic Decklink 4K card will capture because it has a breakout, it has a breakout cable that will present uh, uh, the old style uh, cabling to it. But it won't fix the scaling, so you end up having to play some play some games after, do some post processing before you can set it up to YouTube. Otherwise, it's a little tiny screen on a big canvas. Good point there, Bill. Yeah, I did a good little bit of VHS roll off back in the early days when I was fiddling around with digital video computing, and it can be a little bit problematic. First of all, the VHS raster is pretty narrow, a two hundred and 60 lines, it's interlaced, and it's kind of a mess. Um, even the original DV, the 2.5, 3.5 megabits a second is more than enough to capture a, a VHS signal. But as Peter was just alluding to, the raster is so small compared to what we're all used to now that you either get a small window or you have to blow it up. The other thing is just timing and consistency. Uh, those old analog video formats really, they degraded over time. And if you want a decent picture out of it, you really have to kind of strip out and relay what's called the time-based correction of the signal. Make sure that the color and uh, luminance information is all in time. So uh, that time-based corrector function is sometimes built into the translation things, but sometimes you have to use an outboard device if you really want to clean up those, those VHS tapes, if you're rolling them off. Now, if they're pre-captured, the other thing is that you're going to have to live with whatever is on there. Uh, one thing that used to happen is people would leave VHS tapes horizontal at a big stack for years at a time. And the bottom of that used to curl a little bit just from gravity. So at the bottom of the raster playing back a picture as the helical scan left that part of the video, you get a little tearing at the bottom. That's really common on digitized VHS things. And so often you have to crop up and get rid of some of those anomalies around the signal. It can be uh, time consuming and a little bit uh, PITA to get things done, but um, it's all possible. Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, so the um, Elgato um, video capture, if you don't have an M1 Mac is the is the tool that you probably want to do. It does, it's not compatible with the M1. It, it'll take the RCA outs of your VHS. Um, that's probably the, the entry level of doing that. A lot of us think of Elgato for a lot of things, but that's where they 
started <laughs> was, was being able to capture stuff uh, from from uh, RCA cables to analog RCA from the VHS into the computer. And Courtney? Uh, I use a standalone capture device rather than use a computer to capture. I use this uh, <clears throat> for analog VHS tapes. I use this one called Digit Now. It has uh, HDMI input and output, also analog uh, component output. So if your VHS machine has component output, you can feed it into the RGB or YUV uh, connections there on the back for component or composite video input here. And it will digitize it and put it out over HDMI. And so you can see it, what it's going to look like on a high def um, machine. Then it just has one record button on the side records to in a USB drive plugged into the side of it and records H.264 files and it turns out a pretty decent capture. And you don't have to tie up your computer or, or uh, worry about it filling up your hard drive and uh, works pretty well. You can find them on Amazon for about $150, something like that. All right, I'm bringing in a couple of comments from our producers in the chat. Chris Widener says, Aver Media or Hopodge, I hope I said that correctly, has equipment that can do it. Mickey Makajor says you can do a lot with a free version of Resolve for enhancing or restoration. Next question. Next one comes from Brian Brecker in Charlottesville, Virginia. He says, what is the recommended tilt angle to minimize reflections when using an LED TV as a background element of a set? Any other general tips when hanging a TV as a background? Go ahead, Courtney. All right, get one that uh, does tilt up and down that you can adjust. Usually most of them will, will give you up, up to about 10 degrees. And so just use the minimum amount that gets the reflection out. So turn off the TV, point the camera at it with your lighting on and uh, tilt it down so you don't see any reflection of the lights anymore. And you should be pretty good to go and make sure and try and put yourself a few, you know, a foot or two in front of it. Don't get too close to the screen. Otherwise your reflection might be seen, but most of the time, unless you're heavily backlighting yourself, you won't see your reflection because the light from the screen will wash out uh, any light reflection other than reflections of lights themselves, the instruments themselves, you won't see uh, your reflection in the, in the surface of the video. And Alex. And of course the, you know, the angle of incidence equals angle of reflection. So it's a dance. Uh, it's a dance between when you have your, your, your monitor here, you have your camera here. Um, and where your lights are. So a lot of times the lights need to, you know, be in a position that's a little bit more vertical. And and, and sometimes we will um, flag them off, you know, or, you know, so that to make sure that they're, we're trying not to have them hit um, the, the um, here at all, hit, hit the monitor at all. The other thing is, is if you're, you have to remember that if your camera is higher, it's going to also um, tend to grab different things. And so you have to look at the height of your camera um, obviously this position, Courtney's right, you want to move away from it. I usually two or three feet is usually what I try to get as far as how far we try to get away from that. And then it's about 10 degrees is what we tend to lean it down as an automatic, um, but but about 10 degrees. And then, um, but as Courtney said, you want to make it adjustable. Um, but you have to remember that your lights and your camera height are all part of that equation. So moving those can also change the position of your reflections. And Bill. And if your lights are not the lights that are actively lighting your talent if you just are seeing reflections of miscellaneous rights around uh, lights around your studio or something like that or your location uh there's a material that is commonly taken on sets called duvetine it's a very heavy black felt like material and we've commonly looked at the picture and gone oh there's some reflections and just hanging a piece of duvetine on a stand or putting it somewhere where that cuts the angle of that non-useful practical light hitting the screen can really help you a lot next question Next one comes from Graham Cardwell in Belfast, Northern Ireland. I'm shooting at 1080, 50 frames per second for a client for training purposes. My footage is around 15 gigabytes, but I'm limited to two gigabytes for distribution. Is there an app or ready reckoner that could help me adjust settings to max maximize the quality of the smaller files? Courtney? Yeah, Handbrake is a good uh, free uh, recompressor uh, format converter. Uh, and they have, uh, you didn't say how long your video was, so it's kind of hard to gauge uh, uh, what 
I don't know what you were shooting in that made it 15 gigabytes large, but you probably want to shoot for an H.264 output. And Handbrake has presets that you can set it for uh, based on, you know, where you're planning on sending that video. It'll have a preset for YouTube upload and so on. So you want to look at H.264 if you uh, and set it for 1080p at about five uh, uh, megabits per second, five to 10 megabits per second. Start at the higher rate, 10 megabits and see what the file size ends up after you compress it and if it's still too big then you can change it to a lower uh, lower com uh, megabit rate bit rate and uh, the quality may suffer a little bit but um, you can probably squeeze it down to the right length to uh, fit into their requirements alex yeah and if you're using a mac uh, compressor is a pretty good tool for that um, and it will also give you estimates of what um what how, how big your file is going to be so as you start to change that that band that bandwidth you obviously want to if you have two gigs use 1.9 <laughs> you know so so just turn it up until you until you get to that so you might end up with being able to do 50 megs a second depending on how you caught the original footage if the original footage is in some kind of low compressed format then you might be able to get a lot of savings without giving up any quality. There is a two-pass filter. It'll take a lot longer. Um, if this is going to be your archive that you're going to use, you probably want to go ahead and use that second pass um, to make sure that between scenes you don't end up with, um, it basically looks forward a little bit to make sure that uh, you don't end up with some anomalies. And Peter? I was going to, actually, I was gonna, I'll second Alex's come up a compressor because I've had to do that a number of times where I can't take a, a large file and, and actually put it somewhere for somebody else to grab without compressing it down somewhat. The other one, as I've discovered recently, is uh, DaVinci will do that as well. Resolve will do that you, as you well. You should not do that. <laughs> yeah, I should not do, do that. <laughs> you, you, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I just want to make sure people clear. The H.264 compression in DaVinci is a disaster. Well, I wasn't you, using, I wasn't doing that. I was using this, the general compression routines. Okay. I, I don't, the only thing I output from DaVinci is as un- you know, like eight Apple ProRes works really well. And yeah. some of the other high-end formats work really well. Anything that DaVinci does that reduces the file size generally makes it much worse. Like it's not, it, they just haven't invested enough in there. And we, I couldn't figure out why the H.264 files that I was outputting from DaVinci were such a disaster until I talked to someone there like, oh, don't ever do that again. <laughs> you know, so so the um, someone that would know. <laughs> so, so anyway, uh, in Resolve, I wouldn't use Resolve to reduce file size. It's not uh, in com via compression. Their uh, their approach to it hasn't been ironed out yet. That's a good Good, yeah. good tip. Thank you. Yeah. Always, always export. And generally, just as a general note from Final Cut, Resolve, whatever you have there, I generally almost always will output a final file that is, the, is an archive level file. So it is as high res as I can make it. Then I use some kind of compression routine, whether that's going to be handbrake or, or compressor or something else to turn it into that. That way you don't have to go back to the render either. You know, like you always have something, it'll, it'll compress a lot faster, but, but you want to use the tool for what it's used for. But the Resolve, I use Resolve a lot. <laughs> it's a really great app. Just, just don't output H.264s. Very good to know. And for our producers, we have lots of time for you to, there's no question too small or too little, feel free to pop that into the chat. So that'll give our panelists enough time to do any research in advance of answering your question. Next question. Robin Cutshaw in Atlanta, Georgia is up next. And his question or her question for all I know is what SDI to HDMI and HDMI to SDI converters do you use? Pros and cons of Blackmagic uh, micro converters versus Terranex versus others. Go ahead, John Wallace. Yeah, the black magic uh, bi-directional converters are really great to use if you don't need any sort of up-down. If you're looking at up-down converters, I would definitely start looking into uh, the Decimator products, uh, a lot smaller than the Terranex that you list there. Terranex probably works well. I have no experience with it. I typically just have a Decimator in my bag if I have to do any sort of conversion. Peter? Well, uh, I guess I'll second John. I have both the decimator in my in my kit bag, and I also have a pair of the uh, uh, Blackmagic 3G uh, SDI to HDMI converters because I have some cameras and that I often use that are like a. If I place them out, they're usually 100 feet or so away from the ATEM, and I need something to get that back. And SDI is the safe bet. So SDI to HDMI converter back to my ATEM. And Courtney, if I got the new. Of course, if I got the new ATEM, I wouldn't need the converter anymore for those cameras. Courtney, um, I'd use the MDHX from Decimator. It's um, 
it has a lot of uses. It has a little LCD screen you can see there on it. So it tells you not only, uh, you know, what mode you're in, it tells you what your incoming video is at. So it'll tell you you've got 1080p, 1080i, 1080spf, 1080. You know, there are seven different flavors of uh, HD input, and it will convert bidirectionally. So it'll go SDI in to HDMI out and HDMI in to SDI out. And it'll even form, uh, because of these uh, outputs over here on the right side, you can also set it up as a SDI distribution amplifier. So it solves all of those problems. And it's I think it's under $300. So I think that's probably the best one. And also frame rate converts, which a lot of the Blackmagic uh, converters do not do. So it's easy to operate. You can change the settings without attaching a computer to it or dealing with dip switches. And it, um, it works as kind of a meter to tell you what your inputs and outputs are set to. And bringing in our community in the chat. So Chris Sabato says a decimator, which has been mentioned, MD dash, I believe that's LX, if you don't need scaling. And then Mickey Makachor says an AJA. Next question. Next one comes to us from Michael Smith, and Michael is in Silverado, California. Michael says, N uh, NASA's DART spacecraft to slam into an asteroid at 6 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time on NASA TV, I guess today. DART to hit at 7.14 Eastern Daylight Time. Panelist thoughts. Go ahead, Bill. This is science fiction movies come to life, and I think it's fascinating. Uh, they've been talking for a long time about what if that killer asteroid was headed into a path that might impact uh, our home planet. And there was always a thought about doing something kinetic to try to get out there far, far away and change its trajectory so that you could avoid the inevitable collision. And it's kind of fascinating to me that they're trying this in real life. They're testing this idea of kinetically moving an asteroid a tiny bit, but that of course, tiny bit over the vast distances of space could make a huge difference. So good luck on the test and I hope everything works according to plan. It would be comforting to know that we might have that capability in the future. Go ahead, Alex. I think there should be, a, I think NASA hopefully does a big watch party and they start by doing a doing a big watch party where they do play Armageddon. Yeah. Just <laughs> kind of set the case, you know, let, let's all watch Armageddon and see we now have more than 18 hours or 36 hours or whatever to, to do this. And so we're going to figure out how to not have this be a problem and maybe you should give us more funding, you know, because we'll, we'll watch Armageddon. At Get Bruce end. Willis on the case. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. We just, we, we need more funding to, for, to make sure this, 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 this kind of stuff works. Of course, we could actually accidentally move it in the wrong direction. <laughs> it was just barely going to miss, and now it's not. Anyway. John? So is Aerosmith going to do an Armageddon tour? Is that what's oh, yeah. going to happen? The Armageddon <laughs> tour. No, it's, it's now the dark tour. So it's... <laughs> yeah. Next question. Alex Knight in Vancouver, Canada. Up next, Courtney, a while back, mentioned a power supply that could power multiple 5-volt DC devices. Who makes that? Courtney. Do you remember the power supply that you uh, suggested? Maybe this is the one I was thinking of. This is an Antec, uh, and it's a ACN with a little AC cord there. And uh, it has, uh, what is it, one, two, three, four, five, five outputs. Two of them are two amp, and uh, three of them are one amp output. And it, it handles fast charging. It's DC only, of course, so this one little power supply. Be careful, though, because I have had some problems with these after a while. Their filter capacitors go bad and they can generate some high frequency noise if you're using this power to power an audio device of some sort that requires USB power on an audio device. Sometimes that high frequency from this power supply can leak into the audio. So be very careful about that. But uh, this one's made by Antec and it's, it's probably about 10 years old. So I'm not sure what they look like these days. And Alex, since you're on the on the panel, I'm curious as to what you what's the use case, why you need that. Or you were curious about it? Oh, I was just I was just curious. Yeah, just sometimes ch ch recharging things that that need that. Um, I use I use this kind of stuff at work a lot. So just not having to have separate power supplies plugged in is uh, is really handy. That's what I was thinking, Alex. Lindsay? Yeah, there's a couple different devices that do this, and and like for instance, the yellow brick links all have a they have their own slots, and they they can you can you can power them up, and it's so makes such a big difference when it comes to density. So if you're building a dense rack and you have to put a bunch of these in, um, you know, or a small bag or whatever it is, not having to have a, a wall work for each one is huge. Gotcha. Next question. 
Chris Widener in Lafayette, Indiana, up next with my Roland VH1 HD. Seems to have much lower latency for HDMI iMag, image magnification, than my ATEM Extreme. Suggestions for settings to check. Who are our ATEM Extreme folks on the panel? Alex? Yeah, I think that what's happening there is that it has, it's not doing a frame conversion. I'd, I'd be interested to know whether the Roland has um, internal uh, conversion in it that it's converting or it needs everything to be the same, same frame rate. I'm not sure. Courtney? You know, another thing that can get you if you're using a monitor for iMag is check the monitor. And if it has a game mode, they have different modes, you know, TV mode, cinema mode, and game mode. Put it in game mode because game mode will give you the lowest latency because a lot of them have, uh, you know, 24 frame uh, conversion and frame interpolation to make it look better. And all that stuff takes time and delays your uh uh, input to the video screen from your HDMI input on the video monitor to the surface of the screen. So check and see if it has a game mode and see if that will improve your latency somewhat. And Alex? And the other thing is, is that the Roland is really designed for this market. So it may, you know, to be in the same room with the TV. So they may have had extra processing or extra chipsets in there to really minimize that latency beyond what Blackmagic may have chosen to do. Next question. Next question is come from Matt Wood in Newcastle upon Tyne. Now, how have we been in, how have we been enjoying our new Shoot Pro webcam subscriptions? Any favorite or killer features you advise we check out? Go ahead, Alex. I mean the, the one that the one that I'm trying to use, and I <laughs> I had to watch I had to rewatch Friday, and then I just haven't had time to dig into it. Is the remote control of the camera, but the one that I use the most inside of Shoot is definitely the Telestrator. So being able to pick up the phone and point at something and draw on it as a webcam is is pretty useful. I'll jump in here as since I've been I've been traveling, so I, I saw the tail end of the show and just tiring. I missed it. So I've downloaded it. I'm still looking forward to because I'm the telestrator is what I'm most interested in, just because it will make it really easy when you're on the road and or when there's talent that you're working with, like just some mobile or doing something really quickly, especially at an event. So I'm looking forward to everybody else's feedback to see, you know, what other features I should be diving into, but the Telestrator is definitely the one that I'm I'm looking forward to. Bill? Yeah, I haven't had any time to open it either. I bought it on the special because that was an incredible deal. We were really lucky. Nobody knew it was going to go up that much, but we were surprised when the $49 offer the next day became $3.95. Yes. And everybody felt I was like, like ooh. Wow. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that was not, do not wait often is the best advice. Um, anyway, I'm looking forward to checking it out when I get a chance. It looks like a really cool piece of software. Peter? Yeah, I started almost using it this weekend. I mean, I started using it this weekend for the Telestrator function, and I discovered purely by accident, but very useful is if you actually lay it flat on a on the desk, the iPad flat on the desk, then it becomes a black background, which you can chroma key, Illuma key out. And now it just becomes a telestrator on whatever you're putting on the screen, sending it out over Zoom. So that's, that's what I use that a lot this weekend, to be honest with you, uh, pointing things out stuff. So I guess that's my favorite feature. I keep, I'm waiting to see what his what do you say, the electronic pencil or something, the next app? I'm curious to see what that will provide us. That's a really good use case, especially with our, our educators. I can see them just um, being able to use that aspect of it as well. So thanks for that, Peter. Next question. Chris Widener, Lafayette, Indiana, back in this time uh, for live broadcasting from a cornfield. If you don't have noise assist, what would you do to minimize wind noise? Alex. I can't remember the, the other name that we call it, but dead cat, <laughs> dead, dead cat is what you're going to use. Um, so it's a, or blimp. Uh, so you're, you basically, it's a big, big uh, furry thing that's going to go around your shotgun. Um, generally not an actual dead cat. Um, it's, it's just, it's just for, it's a uh, synthetic fur and you'll see these and these, uh, or a blimp. And these will of course, um, diffuse a lot of the, a lot of the stuff that's, uh, moving around your wind jammer uh, mickey you know, gave us the, the more correct <laughs> but i've never heard it called that in the field um so anyway so um but a wind jammer uh so that that's what you'd probably typically use um to bring that down the other thing that we've done is block it 
So we we literally find, you know, we brought stuff where there's wind and we have a physical block that we'll just, we put right outside a camera to kind of drop some of that that out. And sometimes we do both. Bill? I had heard less right code softy. I did the, the cat terminology has been around the industry forever and most everybody uses that. Uh, right code is one of the companies that made the original one. So right code softy is what I tend to refer to it when I'm trying to be polite and not offend people who are into tiny companion animals. Um, it's, it's a really good system. The other thing is that for me, uh, the blimp usually is the hard surface and they sell these, the, the big companies who do this very seriously for people who have to shoot out in massive windstorms. The blimp goes around, usually has foam and a metal cage or some sort of plastic cage around it. And then there's a softy that goes on top of that to provide the maximum amount of wind protection in very difficult conditions. So those systems are out there and, and they work incredibly well. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, as far as Rycote goes, their softy line is actually a foam type windscreen with a uh, furry cover sometimes or a fabric cover of some sort, uh, but it's foam. And their basket windscreens are the ones that uh, uh, Bill was talking about where you have are the really the best ones and because they give you about an inch or two inches of dead air space between the outside of the windscreen and the microphone itself. So if you have that two inches of dead air space, uh, and then a diffuser, which is the basket with some cloth material over it. And sometimes the wind jammer is the furry thing that you slide over the basket to break up uh, the wind even further. If it gets above about five or 10 miles an hour, you need the wind jammer because that uh, long fur will break up, you know, up to 20 miles an hour. So it can really eliminate a lot of the low frequency wind noise is not going to get to your microphone. And, uh, so look for a basket windscreen. The ones that are foam are less effective in high in high winds. And Mickey in the chat, Mickey McIntyre says that if you're talking about the wind hitting the mic elements, put wind protection on the mics. If you're talking about the noise of the crops moving, work with physics. Uh, appropriate mic choice plus good mic placement. Next question. Next question comes to us from Alex Knight in Vancouver, Canada, playing around with the Cinelike profiles on my Lumix camera. The Cinelike D seems to be some kind of log profile, and Cinelike V is optimized for video. I tried the video profile, but my skin tone looks pale. Not sure why. Alex, which one are you using right now? Because you... Yeah, I'm, I'm using the, um, the Cinelike D, and I actually just before we got on here, we had to make some adjustments here because I, I stuck on a Tiffin Pro Mist filter, which made me look a little pastel. So we had to tweak it. Okay, Alex Lindsay. Yeah, yeah. So the um, the Cine like generally means we're going to raise the blacks a little bit. We're going to you know it's it's a that's the when they say Cine like it's it, it tends to be a lower contrast image. Um, the uh, so I think that. You know, Cinelike V is going to again raise those blacks a little bit, which is and and also desaturate um, the the footage a little bit. So it's it's like extended video on a on Black Magic's um, version. So uh, if you really want video video, then you probably there's probably another setting there that is just a pure video uh, function. But a lot of these are designed to protect the blacks and the whites so that you can crush them a little bit later on your own choosing. Um, in post. So so basically what you, what, what it's doing is saying we're going to make sure that we have all that data and then you can go in where you have more time and push it back to where it is. Unfortunately, when this came out, a lot of YouTubers didn't know that. They just set it to that and then it became like a fad where everything was desaturated and had raised blacks and it became something that people thought was, you know, what the, what, you know, it's what the kids did. But it was just because they, I don't, th I, th I think they just because they didn't know better. So, so they, they just thought that, oh, it looks kind of different. And so, um, so anyway, so you want to um, think about how to go back and find, you know, for, especially for this kind of show, uh, go back and find the, the blacks um, that are, you know, in, in the, that are there. Courtney? Yeah, for live video, I think your best bet is if it has a Rec 709 setting, which is the standard broadcast video setting for the uh, color palette, um, that would get you a lot closer with deeper blacks. And uh, the, the Cine-like uh, settings, as Alex said, are designed for post-coloration, you know, so coloring in post that preserve your detail in the blacks so that you can uh, bring up detail in the blacks if you've got a dark scene, et cetera. Uh, but, uh, and you can bring the black levels back down again in post. But since you're not applying a, uh, a LUT to it on the way out, uh, 
just the regular REC 709 will get you a lot closer to the standard contrast rate. Next question. Douglas Carmichael's up next, and he says, I'm considering either a Juniper SRX 300 router or a Cisco ISR 1131 router for a home office setup. The SRX 300 would require a Wi-Fi AP, while the ISR 1131 has a built-in Wi-Fi 6 AP. Which would you recommend? And he notes he's worked with both iOS and Juno's operating systems. Go ahead, John Wallace. The Cisco ISR from the future sets I looked at looks like it has better throughput, uh, lots more expandability, has 5G support uh, from a feature set specifically without any really understanding of use case. Uh, it looks like the ISR would be the better choice. Peter? Yeah, I'd probably pick on the ISR as well. With the one caveat is, will the Wi-Fi reach to where you want it to be reached? In which case, you know, like in my house, it would not. So I had to put in separate access points to make it reach. Harshid? You might be on mute. Yes, there we go. Almost. We'll go to Alex and then come back. Alex? I just want everyone to know that uh, we're going to, it has nothing to do with this, this answer. I don't have an answer for this, but I just want everyone to know that we're going to move to the second hour early if we don't have more questions. So you have a opportunity to throw a couple more questions in here and uh, and we'll uh, we'll address them um, before the second hour or we'll just start the second hour or just just a quick um, uh, public announcement. <laughs> All right, Harshi, let's try that again and let's see. Yeah. No, we still okay, we let's, still let's don't going. have audio. Let's keep. next question. Okay, the next one comes from Robert Green in Los Angeles, and he says, Gray Matter has several episodes in the can. What technical challenges have you experienced? Go ahead, Alex. So um, Gray Matter is, is the show that we're working on with Michael Krasny, and we recorded over Zoom, and we're trying to keep the quality as high as we possibly can. Um, and some of the challenges that we've had so far is that, you know, we send out, we send mics to everyone or try to, some people won't use them, um, but because uh, they tell us that they do this all the time. This is the, the, the poison that the broadcast has created is they were putting up with people just opening up their laptops and being on CNN. And so now everyone thinks that, that that's okay. Um, and they just produce a lot of bad audio. So we send them out mics. Um, they don't use them very well because they've never used a mic before um, because CNN th said it was okay to use their laptop mic, not that I'm bitter. And, um, and so, the, uh, so, so we have a little bit of challenge there. We've also, you know, we have to record. Um, <laughs> it's kind of funny. The webinar has a button that says record ISO audio, but it doesn't actually work. So if you have more than one person, you know, we, we need to separate those. There's no way to separate those without Zoom ISO um, for, those, for those records over Zoom. Um, so that, that has been another challenge, um, like the last one. And part of what happened here is we, had to, we swapped out the Ken Burns one for some of the other ones that we have in the can. And that's because uh, his show was coming out last week. So we wanted to make sure that we had it out on the right time. So, so those are some of the things that, um, that, that affect that. And then right now, it has up until now been going right through me. Um, I'm, the, I'm the editor for those shows. And uh, as a result, when I have four, live, four major live events in 10 days, um, everything slows down. <laughs> so, so, so it's a, you know, over 10 days or over the last 14 days. So when you swap a, a show and then you have a couple technical errors, you know, we've had a lot of little, little errors on Zoom, um, you know, Zoom where we just have clicking or we have, we had one where someone just coughed a lot and we took all that out and, or I didn't take it out. That was the one that I didn't do because it was going to be, it took like seven hours to take all those coughs out because they're clearing their throat like every couple minutes. And uh, so, so the, uh, so those are the kind of things that we have to kind of wrestle with and sometimes it slows things down, but we should be putting them out every week after uh, starting this week. So we'll have another one out this week and we should get caught up slowly um, as we, as we go down that path. Are you, Oops, I think you were muted, Liberty, if you said something. Yes, that was me looking at Peter, wondering why Peter didn't answer. So go ahead, Peter. And I was waiting for you to point at it to talk to me. So, <laughs> so I guess the question I would ask, a variation on the theme is, this appears to be primarily an audio podcast aimed at audio. Is that where most of your technical issues are? Yeah, it's all, we don't care about the audio. We, we're, not, we're not worried about the video right now. So the video is something that's, almost, you see it in the live. So when you go to, if you watch uh, Gray Matter live, you'll see the video. Um, and that is actually going to be R&D. So I, starting hopefully this week, 
you'll see me, me playing with Zoom ISO and I'm going to use that as R&D, but we're not publishing that anywhere. So we're really focused on the audio and trying to maximize the quality of the audio. And the, the challenge there is really that you're dealing with a lot of different people at home um, that either, you know, that oftentimes don't use the mics as well as they could. We're dealing with some connection issues with Zoom, you know, because it's their home and they don't, you know, it's, we're not getting to take them into studios. And so a lot of it does need some cleanup um, to make it actually um, as good as it could be, you know, out of, out of that process. And it's different, you know, for instance, we ended up with all the, the Ken Burns one with everything was mucked together. You know, the three people were mucked together because I couldn't get the, I, I just didn't understand something about, about them. it was my fault. I didn't understand something about Zoom ISO that I needed to understand to, to get that to work. Um, and um, the, and again, part of this has also been exa exasperated by the, exasper exacerbated by uh, the fact that I've, I have four, I have four major events in, in a very short period of time. So, you know, it's just a matter of, I have very, very little time over the last three weeks to do anything. So the, um, uh, so anyway, so they were mucked, so they had to be all separated. And then all of them have different EQs, all of them have other cleanup, all of them have things that they're, you know, so it, 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 it's something that should be some, you know, theoretically simple to, to, to maximize it. And we want, really want it to be as, as close to a studio experience as possible. That's what we're playing for. Um, you know, I, I have a pet peeve about radio. I stopped listening to radio because I'm tired. Of, I, I won't listen to talk radio because I'm tired of call-ins. Like, I just don't like listening to phones. And I finally just got to a point, especially, I think it was partially the fault of the show, is that I really just got to a point where I just can't listen to bad audio. Like, I'm just not interested anymore. Like, you know, like, and, and I won't listen to it. And so I don't want to build a show that I don't want to listen to. So, so we're, you know, it's an expensive thing that we're sending out these mics because I just will not listen to people's bad audio anymore. I just turn it off. And so um, I just, I'm just like, it's not, not worth it. You know, so, um, so as a result, my, my, uh, um, my judgmentalness about bad audio means that I spend more time on it and I'm not doing it perfectly. I'm not, I haven't done audio engineering for a long time, but, but I'm doing it better than it was when it came in. So. And Bill. I know we're kind of pushing this into new things, but I've had the same kind of frustrations and just recording my little final cut things on here on Fridays. Uh, it's been really fascinating how few controls as somebody who wants to do a local recording of, of some video and audio content coming off of Zoom. It's, it's really been very unintuitive. The first shows I did, I recorded uh, the panel view. I didn't even get my individual um, interviewee or the, myself, my, my internal camera, and I tried to figure out how to split the camera off into a separate recording. It's just been way more complicated than I, than I would ever have expected it to be. And I hope they do increase the uh, utility of whatever the system is so we can get some feedback on these things because it would be really useful. We're doing content and, you know, we're hoping to try to help people by giving them suggestions on how to use these things and to make it this hard to go back. And I've had the same frustration that Alex had. I've had to go through and just take out all sorts of little tiny errors. And it takes way longer than you think that it really should. So I hope they, they lock this down and get it right coming up someday. Next question. Next question comes to us from Ronnie Settle in La Plata, Maryland. I run a weekly broadcast using 6Ks and an ATEM Mini. I'm setting camera settings every week in the ATEM software. Alex mentioned setting a LUT in the camera to avoid this. I'm using the default video LUT, and I need to set a color temp. Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, this is still a kind of a work in progress that, we, that we've worked, that we're doing to match cameras, which is that basically what you need to do, and I don't think there's any way to do it unless you do it perfectly. <laughs> so, so what you have to do is you have to set up a DeMont chart and I haven't been able to do it with anything other than a DeMont chart. Um, and you might be able to use an X-Rite, but it, it really has been easier because the DeMont chart displays itself correctly on a vector scope. Um, and so we take a DeMont chart, we, we shoot it with each camera, um, with the lens that that camera is going to use. It has to be the lens that you're going to use. Um, we correct the first one and you really need to have the first one, um, the, you, before you do that, you get the first one set um, so that you have a LUT that you, um, that you like for skin and for the per people. You want it to look correct um, in, that, in that area. And um, uh, you then shoot that chart. Then you take that chart into, um, uh, into, into resolve and then set and then match the other cameras, and, you know, and, and it's a complicated thing because the exposure has to be right. So really coming out of the cameras, we're learning a lot about this and I wouldn't say we're there yet, but we're getting there. Um, 
is that you need to have the exposure on, the, on each chart, using your aperture, um, lighting, everything else. You have to shoot it all at the same time, and the exposure has to be exactly the same, and you have to be able to look at scopes coming out of the camera to see it. Uh, otherwise, it, it get, it's a lot harder to correct. So it's not a quick <laughs> quick solution um, to make these things work. It, it really requires some thought. Now, one of the things that we can do with the charts that we're experimenting with and we haven't been 100% successful with is just using the autocorrect inside of Resolve for some of these charts that it has, it's kind of built for that. Um, but we haven't, that hasn't resulted in exactly what we expected yet. And so we're still figuring out some of the bits and pieces related to that. And some of this has to do with, um, you know, basically the transform uh, the, of um, of how you're going from the camera's uh, native sensors to the, you, know, you have to figure out exactly, you know, what that color transform is going to be. So it's, it's a complicated problem right now um, that has worked in the past, but it has, you know, it's pretty tricky to, to get it just right. Um, and so we're, we're going to do a class on it, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't take it on just yet. <laughs> like once, once we get it nailed, it, it takes, it's taken a lot more work than, than we expected when we got into it. It, it is okay. a permanent thing though. And you can match any camera to any camera when it works. And there's some really good feedback in the comments too, Ronnie. So take a look at the chat. Next question. Next one comes from Chris Widener in Lafayette, Indiana. Alex, we're going to have a, uh, we're going to, going to have a multi-budget mic shootout or or we're waiting for the or alex <laughs> uh, i don't uh, the uh um i haven't uh, yeah i will have a, a mic shootout at some point I, I i spent my my wad on on mics for a while so we're it's going to be until i can rent them or someone will lend them to us for a little while we're gonna we're gonna hang out and not do any more mic. <laughs> i'm not gonna buy any more mics right now so that's where we're at right now and Alex Knight is also a, a, a Mike fanatic. I remember early on when you came on, Alex. You got a couple of them laying around? Oh, yeah. I've got some microphones. I've got RE20s. I got this mm -hmm. SE2200 back here, right. which I'm trying to figure out if I'm still going to use because it's, it's a little bit of a tall microphone. So, And Courtney? If we could get Alexander and Alex and um, Paul from Texas. Wallace. Oh, Wallace. We got them all. We got them he all. He has a collection of everything, and we can do a comparison shootout between the three of them. Yep. We should have all the bases covered. The, the challenge really is getting all the mics in the same place with the same person at the same time, um, because that really is what makes it, you know, it's apples to apples at that point. It's really hard to, to guess any other mic outside of that. Alex Knight? I was just going to say, and this is just an offer because I have act, I can take as many microphones from work as I want every week. So if you want help with microphones, I can I can bring microphones. Okay, excellent. excellent. <laughs> nice. Next question. Next one comes to us from Chad Lafarge in Columbia, Missouri. He says, I need to switch between two HDMI inputs and output both a pass-through signal and a vertically flipped HDMI with the fewest pieces of hardware. Can you suggest the right combination at under $500? Alex? I'm not sure that there is one under $500. I think that the tricky part would be, I think you'd have to use something like Mimo or vMix or something like that. You'd have to use a software processor to um, do that because most of the hardware that does that is relatively inexpensive. Courtney? Relatively expensive, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was trying to come up with something. With Decimator, you could use the MD Quad, which is uh, SDI in and four HDMI out. It'll do vertical flipping on any of the outputs. You can set the outputs. You can do picture in picture. You can do one full screen or on your four, four HDMI outputs, you can do quad view. Um, or you can just switch between one, two, three, and four outputs. Uh, but um, the inputs are all SDI, so you'd have to take to MDLX or some low price, you can find, probably find a, a low price uh, HDMI to SDI converters to put them on the inputs of the MD quad. Uh, the quad is $500 by itself, uh, but if you can convert from HDMI to SDI on the input of the quad, the quad will do it because it can flip individual outputs and leave the other outputs the same. Mm -hmm. And then you can switch between the different inputs that are coming in over the SDI. It has four SDI inputs and four SDI and four HDMI outputs. So you can route them and switch them as needed with uh, external USB software. You can actually do the switching. And Bill. 
Now, I don't know what you're actually trying to do. If you're looking for a teleprompter thing on one end, what I manage, and it's, I think, around 500, maybe a little bit under that, uh, the most expensive part of the process is a Lilliput monitor that I have under my teleprompter, and it does the flipping of that last leg. So in front of that, there's an HDMI splitter from Triplight that is powered active and gets two robust signals out from one feed in. Now, the question for me is that if you put that one feed in on an AB switch and fed that with two things, I just recently had the problem. I was having trouble with office hours, and I think it's because I had hooked up both a laptop and an iPad through one of those inexpensive AB switches. And it seemed like it was degrading the initial signal coming in enough. It didn't give me a problem in terms of the display of this kind of forked system, but uh, it did damage the signal a little bit. So I was getting some instability. So I took it back out of there. I think with a higher level AB switch, you might be able to do it if that's your goal. If the goal is to flip one for like a teleprompter thing at the end and you don't need control of that. Next and question. I, I just, sorry, let me just uh, correct myself that I said MD quad. It's actually the Demon 4S in the decimator line is the one I was speaking of. Demon awesome. 4S. Thanks for that correction. Next question. Next question comes from J.D. McKenna. So for, the fir for a first-time adopter who has been using a 2019 i9 MacBook Pro, would one of the newer silicon iterations be an acceptable replacement for video editing? John Wallace. Any of them would be. Uh, the dedicated video encoders uh, with the M1 chip make it so it's very hard for the Intel uh, Macs to keep up with any sort of video editing uh, demands versus the M1 chipset. Peter? Well, I, I can't speak to his 2019 i9 MacBook Pro, but I'm using a 24 core Mac Pro, and my M1 Mac beats it out every time trying to uh, do rendering. And Nigel? Yeah, it's the same thing. Uh, I think almost anything will work better now, the i9, unless you're doing something that is a lot of 8K streams, in which case you probably should be on a MacBook. Uh, anyway, the one thing I tell you to be careful of is some of the plugins that we use uh, don't work well still with Apple Silicon. But if you're staying on Final Cut Pro or you're staying on uh, DaVinci, I don't use um, the Adobe products, uh, you'll find that the performance is vastly improved. Next question. Next one comes from Robin Cutshaw in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm looking for a generic control panel with motor faders that can be used by multiple applications. Is there something like the X-Touch that is not specific to that family of devices? John Wallace? The X-Touch uh, actually allows for Mackie control, so you can actually use that for multiple DAWs. It's not just a Behringer-only product. Uh, and then Waves makes a product called, um, let me pull it up here, uh, the Fit Controller. Uh, that also has MIDI controls. Uh, the Fit controller is actually very expensive, but if you're looking for motorized faders, uh, it can be tough to find within the MIDI family. And Alex? Yeah, the, 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 what we used in the past was the BSC, BS, uh, BCS 2000 um, is, a, is an old Behringer that you can still buy on eBay um, that has a lot of sliders that all, um, a, a lot of faders that are motorized as well as pots that you can um, adjust uh, and they, those are all addressable. Next question. Matthias Hulia in uh, Helsinki, Finland. I hope I'm getting that right. If you need to produce live shows with different camera brands, what tools or techniques should you use for shot matching? I'm using a mix of Sony and Canon cameras with an ATEM Vision mixer. Go ahead, Alex. You need a chart. Um, you, you really need to get a chart. It's going to be really hard to match these cameras with a, without a chart. Um, so you need a DeMont chart or an x right chart. I don't do anything without a Chroma DeMont chart, when I ha especially when I have to do extra, when I have multiple cameras with different lenses you know, on them. So really think about what an investment in that area to sync them up. At worst case, you can try to just let them white balance each other, you know, white balance to the chart or to a gray, and it may get close, um, but it'll never look quite right. Um, you all generally have to, you have to co correct to the lowest common denominator. So the one that's got the least controls, I don't know which Sony, which camera you have. Generally, the Sony will have more controls for it than the Canon will. But it's a it's a bit of a mess. Um, you know, in there, if they have LUTs, that's where we're doing all this R&D with LUTs is to either put them what we've done in the past, matching Sony cameras to Blackmagic, is running them through a LUT box and then using the LUT to correct the Sony, um, because uh, that's what we're really digging into, because we think it's going to be eventually how we handle a lot of this, because it's just impossible to get through the color science between each one of these cameras if you're trying to mix and match. And then we do everything we can not to mix and match, because it's almost impossible. Next question. 
Liberty White in Atlanta, Georgia is up next. Liberty, you've been actively on the Office Hours panel for a year. What have you learned? It's funny to put this question out there for myself, but this is for the, the community as well. I'll try to do this in 60 seconds, is putting yourself out there. Um, I think the first panel I was on was in 2021 in February, and this was my way of having professional development without having to go necessarily outside and going to different events. So, um, and then towards the a year ago, Alex had just mentioned, you know, becoming a reader. So my second lesson was I was a horrible reader. <laughs> so find your lane, find, I was fumbling people's names and in it, you know, coming from a journalism background, like that's the worst thing you can do. So I shifted over into a space where I could shine, which is as the host and also producing um, the sessions that happen on Monday. So find your niche because as technical as our group is, there are subsets. So I just put it out there to anyone. If it's go join the community in the back end or find, you know, hop on the panel, answer a few questions, find, find your lane. So um, thank you all for being so gracious to me and I'm celebrating my one year anniversary. So I'm super happy about that. Great job. Great job. Lily. <laughs> thank thank really you. Well done. Next question. Absolutely. You may have been unsure, but we're lucky to have you. Robert Green in Los Angeles has the next question. Recommendations for Wi-Fi 6, 6E routers. John. Oh, when it comes to the all-in-one, I really like the Asus brands. If you're looking for like a ubiquity, there's tons of different options there. I would stay away from 6E. There's just no value to it. Next question. Bo Cordell in Charleston, South Carolina is up next. He says, Unreal Fest is coming up in October. Anyone making the trip to New Orleans? Alex. Uh, I don't know anyone who is, but if you are, definitely let us know. We'd love to get you to come in or, or report on it uh, afterwards. We're definitely interested in what's happening there. And Bill. I suggest a live inset from the Café du Monde or are there any of the 10,000 restaurants in New Orleans that are absolutely stunning and uh, make sure that you ship tasting to the rest of us. <laughs> oh, yeah. One word, beignet. beignet. There you beignet. go. Right. Every morning. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. And chicory coffee. Oh, missed that. All right. Dennis Champion Walker, Mansfield, UK. Is it just me or who is irritated by the Morning USA Loco in For All Mankind? It has way too much detail to be displayed in standard definition. Go ahead, Alex. I'm not, I haven't been irritated at all because I, I haven't seen more than the first 10 minutes of all for all mankind. So it hasn't bothered me, it hasn't bothered me at all. And Courtney? Uh, it's you, Dennis. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just get you a better TV set. Okay. Come up from standard definition. You know, all the world has moved on to HD. Just named it. I think, I, I think it's the, the idea that it wouldn't, it wouldn't work back when they did it. I think that's the, that's the challenge there. Yeah. yeah. Next question. Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas says, what is the video pencil beta and why do we need it relates to shoot? Oh, good question there, Paulo. Alex? Yeah, Video Pencil is is another um, thing that uh, Michael Forrest has been working on, and it's uh, it's in beta right now, and it will let you take use NDI to get video into it and draw over it and send back NDI out. So you can actually do some of the telestration that we're doing here just on an iPad using if you're if you're using NDI. So it looks like a pretty interesting product. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, I didn't know Alex was winging. That's exactly it, and that's done. And Peter. The other thing that's interesting, if you compare that to the shoot app, and he kind of he he said this last week when he was talking about it, he's actually going to use the real pencil controls in the, in the uh, video pencil app as opposed to he created some controls on the shoot app that don't quite work the way you would expect them to do if you're used to the pencil controls on the iPad. Next question. Paul Wallace, Austin, Texas. The new TV season is starting. Anything worthwhile? Nigel. We've watched uh, two pilots or two new seasons. Uh, I will tell you, Quantum Leap is not as bad as I thought it was going to be, and Monarch is much, much worse. <laughs> is that the remake? Quantum? Is it? Are they remaking Quantum yeah. Leap? Yeah, they, 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 well, they haven't remade it. They've okay. continued the story, but it doesn't have the original cast of Al or. Uh, guy died last year and uh, Bakula didn't come back for reasons I can't follow. But it really wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. But Monarch, I have not seen as much money put on the screen and missed in a long time. Okay. Okay. Alex, real quick. 
Yeah, I think that uh, we've been watching Lord of the Rings and, and the the game of the new Game of Thrones, uh, House of the Dragon, and they, they, they you know so I'm deep in the Middle East. And then the other one that I would highly recommend that is Alias. <laughs> we're almost we're almost done. We're almost in, we're in season five in the last little bit. It's only ten years later or fifteen years later, but the whole family sits down and watches it. It's good. We we always work through one old show at a time, and that's the old one. I think Lost is next. Bill. I haven't watched it, but I'm fascinated. It was at Comic-Con. They had a huge set and display for Abbott Elementary, which is a broadcast show on ABC. And I was astonished. That thing was totally busy the entire time. We were having lunch at a place that overlooked their, they built a whole, the, the whole set from the show on the lawn at Comic-Con. And it, it seemed like it's hugely popular. And I just saw it got a bunch of Emmys. So it must be interesting. John? The show Reboot uh, from the Modern Family Creators looks really interesting. I should be checking out that uh, this week or next week. And I was plus oneing as well, Bill's um, comment, Abbott Elementary. I watched some episodes last season, but now they've got, I think they were only 13 seasons last time and just seeing how, okay, how are they going to do 22 um, seasons and, or sorry, episodes. And yeah, they won a lot. Quinta Brunson and Shirley Ralph. And I think they also got a write, comedic writing one as well. So I'm looking forward to seeing um, more of that. I only pick one show a season so that that's going to be it. And now we're moving into our second hour. So thank you so much for producers for jumping in and adding all of your great questions. Of course, you can come back tomorrow and submit questions. We are going to be talking about working with high profile talent. And I think it would be great to just kind of set the foundation of what high profile is. Um, many of you might have thought celebrity at, at first, but really a high profile talent could and is anyone that is, you know, for our educators, it could be someone that is, whether it be the principal, whether it be someone in the district um, that oversees, uh, not sure title wise what uh, those names could be, but um, anyone who that you know that their time is um, very short, <laughs> very short on time, someone who is in somewhat of an executive position and or um, even a speaker um, could be, especially when you're working on whether it be an event or a show where you have people that are flying in. Um, and there's just a certain care that needs to be needs to to happen. And hopefully I'm looking forward to the panelists um, sharing some some uh, some horror stories. We don't have to say names. Many of you might still be under uh, NDAs in that regards. But the care in which you not only manage their time, manage their calendars and just getting the best out of that talent the reason why we're having this conversation is that it will help you continue to book work um, because these circles, the higher you go, the circles are smaller and people do talk about how they were, you know, how they were handled. I was at um, a conference a couple of weeks ago and just the back and forth that the speaker had with the with the team and just poor management like them getting from the airport it was just really bad and now that we're in an age where social media is so prominent that there are cases i've seen cases where speakers talent um, has gone on social media and just shared their experience is that professional not at all but it happens and just our conversation will talk through how to avoid some of those things um, and then also wanted to just highlight or discuss, you know, how do you get talent prepared, especially at that, um, especially at that level? Um, many times there's a writer, whether that be this official documentation where it's coming from their team that says this is what the speaker needs at the event and that is whether it could be as tedious as the kinds of fruits that should be in in their room and or backstage um yeah i've seen it down to like dates and these specific types of dates and and essentially the writer is just making sure that the production team or the stage management team knows what needs to be in place so that that's just part of what the speaker and or the talent, um, what the talent looks for. Also in this space, you want to have tough skin because as much as you may, you know, you know, you do an exceptional job. Um, 
But then there are just some times that you're dealing with people. And anytime you're dealing with people, you're dealing with um, emotion, you're dealing with just their day, whatever that might, um, what that might look like. And sometimes their feedback to you, it's, it's really not about you. It's about whatever is happening on their side and on their end um, of things. And I would say that the third thing um, that you want to really focus on outside of the technical aspects of things, and we'll definitely get into that as you submit your questions in this area, is just diplomacy as well and how you communicate. Usually there's a, a, a gatekeeper and or a handler um, that you need to to be in contact with that is the person that's either managing their schedule and or just making sure whatever they need. So you might not always get to, you know, touch bases with said executive, but it's that person um, that you're dealing with. And again, they are a person and their main goal is just making sure that this executive, the talent is is good your main goal is to make sure that the production or the event goes off um goes off without a hitch alex yeah so um for about 10 years i was i i we were a white glove team for either google or facebook and we did a lot of pretty high high profile my specialty was heads of state so mostly what i worked on was um you know heads of state <laughs> and then occasionally some uh, you know, some A-level A level actors and, and performers and so on and so forth. So we learned a couple things in that process. One is you want to very quickly gauge, you know, what is their infrastructure around them? So a head of state, for instance, has Secret Service or they have um, they have some version of security um, that, that's going to be there. And uh, there's a lot of infrastructure and a lot of protocol that's going to be involved. And you want to get pretty far ahead of it and figure out exactly what you're doing. If you're working with an, uh, let's say, an, an entertainer, an actor or a, or a musician, um, that's that's at what we would consider, you know, a level. So, um, you know, someone who you everyone would know here, <laughs> um, you would, uh, you know, one of the things you want to look at is is how big of an artist they are. If they are one that everyone knows, they're going to have an entourage. They're going to have people that work around them. And you need to figure out pretty quickly who they are and and um, work with them. You're not going to work with the art. You may not see the artist until, you know, 10 minutes before the event. <laughs> Same thing with heads of state. You may not see them until right before you're working with a lot of other people to make sure that that actually works. Um, the, the other thing to look at is minimizing the number of people talking to them. So you want to minimize the number of people on your team that are talking to their team. Um, it's really easy for you to start people start to start to send cross signals. Someone else is asking something that you already asked or, or they're doing something else and it makes, it makes it very confusing and it frustrates them. So you want someone who's going to manage that conversation between them. It, it may be a couple people, but they have very clear lanes. They're very clear and usually we talk a lot before we send out any emails to, to their team to avoid that. We wanna find out what they need. You know, you know. So, for if it's secure security issues, we we need we might need to be able to get everybody's driver's license, um, their numbers, their so on and so forth to go through it. Um, there might be some background checks for everyone around them, um, and then and then you do really want to find out f what they need from a perspective of when you get here. What what are we going to need? You you want to think about everything from the time they leave their house or office to when they arrive at your space, and try to think of everything that could be a problem and try to uh, you know talk through that. Uh, internally and then find out what they want to do and then propose things if they don't propose certain things. Where, how are they getting picked up? How are they doing those things? And and, and for the larger ones, they, they're they managing that. Like you're not, you just need to know who to talk to if they're not there. Um, if, if they're a little bit, the, the ones that are the hardest to work with sometimes are the ones that are a couple levels down from that high profile where they don't have the infrastructure. They may not have, they may have only one executive assistant or none. Um, there, you know, so these are actors that are usually not the main actors in a <laughs> in a film. Um, they have less infrastructure, and so you have to kind of figure out what they need, and that's the one you really have to take care of because they don't have all of that stuff to manage it. And so, and then that's where you really want to minimize the the amount of um, work that they have to do. Their riders are important if they have them. A lot of them don't. I don't. We don't see a lot of riders go through. Artists that are on tour, you see a lot of riders, but other people when they're coming to things may not have that. But you do want to ask them, like, what kind of coffee, what kind of tea, what kind of fruit, what kind of, you know, those types of things. Don't have them fill out any forms. Don't send anybody in a high profile thing. You have a conversation with their person or with them. You may have a form, but they don't have to fill anything out. You know, like this is this is this is a white glove service that you're going to be taken care of. And there may be a lot of meetings, you know, in that area. Um, little things also. Uh, 
don't ever be late for a meeting. <clears throat> like, you know, so when you're dealing with a high profile and you're dealing with a team, it doesn't matter whether they're late or not, or if they're late all the time, that doesn't, doesn't matter, but you need to be there. Uh, about a minute before that, that meeting is supposed to start, just sitting there waiting to make sure that you're available for them. Um, a lot of them are pretty particular about time. Um, you also need to know where they're going after the event. So how do we get them out? We've had events run four or five minutes over and there's been hellfire, you know, like, you know, because, because they had something else that they had to do, another hit, another meeting, another dinner, and whatever that is. And so you, you want to be able to think through those things. Um, to Liberty's point, you, you absolutely have to think about the diplomacy of it and you have to know where one of the hard parts about dealing with this is when you deal with an entourage or you deal with a large technical team that's there to support folks, you need to quickly understand who everybody is in the food chain, you know, who is answering to who. And when someone tells you you can do something, is that person the person that can tell you to do that? You know, because sometimes I've had ones where someone told me it was fine. I get in there and then their boss comes in and goes, what are you doing? You know, you know, and so, um, and so you have to, you know, figure that out. The other thing that you have to do, and this is the, one of the harder balances is that you are protecting them, you know, sometimes from themselves in the sense that they don't want to work very hard. And like, this is just another thing for them, but wow, will they be upset if they look bad? You know, so while they don't want to set up, they don't want to, especially with virtual events, they don't really want to set up for all of this stuff because no one else makes them do this, you know, and you're working through it. Um, but if you don't spend the time and they're the only ones that don't look good because you did get that done with everybody else, someone's going to call you later and say, why didn't you fix that? You know, like, you know, and, and so you have to kind of balance that. Now there is a point, I would say that, you know, Shannon on our team is the master of this, is there's a point where you can feel it where you're not going to get any further. Like they're just not going to go there. And so then the key is you can't keep going. Like you just like, this is as good as it's going, you know, this is gonna, as good as it's going to get. So, so a lot of those things are balancing all of those, um, those processes, but not being afraid to tell them that like, hey, we, we were dealing with one, they had a big conference room that they use all the time for virtual meetings. This was early in the pandemic and, and they were very proud of it and they wanted to shoot in there and it was unlistenable. Like the mics mm -hmm. that they were using to do it, was so much echo and they had spent millions on this, on this room in Europe. And um, they were kind of mortified when we told them, cause we just played it, you know, we, we, when we told them that it's unlistenable, they said, well, this is where we do all our meetings. And we're like, well, that's too bad. <laughs> like, like we're, we're, you know, we're, we're, you know, so there's, there, you, you don't want to, you know, you have to protect as Liberty said, the event, but it's also protecting them, you know, in that, in that process. And then again, you pick the people who talk to them, you know, we, we tend to refer to them as uh, client facing, you know, team members as opposed to non-client facing. And that has to do with how they hold themselves, how they speak, how they, you know, work with folks. Um, and so know that you're not going to have everybody talk to the client um, because some people just aren't, aren't ready for that. They're a little too can, they're candor, <laughs> a, little, a little too, a little too much candor, uh, a little too much uh, and talking around things. So, you know, you know, I had one, I had one head of state in India where I had to tell him in 45 seconds, all the things that need to be, you're going to come in here, you're going to go down this hall and you're going to take a left. You're going to, and I practiced that over and over and over again so that I could be totally clear, not use one more word than I needed to and give him all the information that he needed to, to, to execute that event. And most of these folks will absorb that really quickly because they get that kind of direction. But what you don't want to do is talk around it and not be clear, you know, and um, because they, they don't have time for that. So those are some of the things that, that I've learned over a little bit of time of doing those. And you actually touched on something really well there of like, if you've done all that you can do, also brace yourself for impact and like what could happen afterwards. Cause mm -hmm. there was, um, especially in the virtual space, we're a bit better now, but there was a, an executive who could not show up or did not show up. And then when they came on, it, it was horrible. And we had mm -hmm. to have a team that was in another room trying to fix their mic, trying to do all of those things. So just bracing yourself, knowing they didn't take the steps necessary that you know. And and the other thing we have, we've learned is you have to like, especially if you're going to do something where they're going to show up and just use your gear. Uh, we had one where we had a couple, uh, the pretty, pretty high profile couple. Um, and, uh, and they, you know, we, the gear was mostly set up and we we're ready to go, but they decided they didn't want anyone. They came in an half, half an hour early and then shut the door, locked it, and said, you can't come back in until right before the show. So then we get there a minute before the show. They open the door, it went in before the show. <laughs> and, and, you know, then we have to set up really, really, you know, we have to finish that setup really fast. So a lot of it is figuring out how you build this, build it for people not to do it exactly the way that you expect them to do it. Um, and just really try to talk to their team about what that, what that looks like. And the ones that are the hardest are big events where there's a lot of VIPs because they've got a lot of other things that they're doing. They've got red carpets, they've got dinners, they've got things. 
and you're just one more thing that they're that they're working on. And so you really have to be careful about how you communicate what's possible and um, and what's there. And that was an early one for us. And we learned not to tell people they could shut the door. <laughs> like, you know, like, this isn't, oh, sorry, we can't. And what we did, I, I know this is not crazy, but we just used larger cables, ran them out the door. And uh, it just meant that you couldn't, you couldn't close shut the, the door. door all the way. Yeah, you couldn't close it. I'm sorry, there's tech tech issue. So that was, that was one of the things we learned over time. Bill? A lot of things said that are really smart here. Oh, the, the thing to me that was the hardest to learn, and I accidentally stumbled into it, was managing your own anxiety in these situations, because suddenly you're face to face with somebody who the world knows. And your your tendency is to shut down a little bit, be uncomfortable. And it's hard to get past that, particularly if somebody you admire. I've had a couple of circumstances where I walked into a room and somebody was there and I just literally wanted to turn around and walk out because I admired them so much. Happened to me with B.B. King and a couple of other people that I just couldn't talk to them. I was like a silly fanboy. And to me, I, you just have to get to the place where you understand that you have a job to do. If you've worked at this for a long time, you you should truly believe in yourself that you know how to do this job. And the most successful relationships I've had with CEOs and things like that, the 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 one that taught me was I walked into a, the cafeteria at the big company and I had been doing work with them for some months and the guy sat down and just started talking to me and I just started talking to him. And only later when I left that initial encounter, which took about 20 minutes because he just, I kept telling him things about where we lived and some things to do because he said he was from out of town. I had a 10 year relationship with that CEO because I just treated him like a regular person. I hadn't shut down like everybody else. And in fact, when I left that table, uh, a senior vice president pulled me aside and said, what did he say to you? And I said, who? He said, Bob. I said, oh, well, we just talked about some stuff. And he said, you know, he's the new CEO of the company. And I didn't. And that was my saving grace is that I didn't treat him like he was made of glass and I could actually relate to him. And that formed the beginning of the relationship that we carried through. I'm not saying this isn't hard. Sometimes you do have to do this with people that you genuinely admire. But if you can connect with them as a human being, and if you're confident in what you're going to do for them, and you could just try to be as normal as possible, it can go a long way. All the rules Alex spoke out, yes, they are, they are more and more important the higher you go up the ladder. But they're used to people kind of freezing around them often, particularly the entertainment stars. And if you can not do that, if you can just be as normal as possible, it can go a long way. Just saying. Very true. Very true. Courtney? Uh, yeah, everyone's made a lot of important uh, uh, points here. If they're uh, a high level celebrity or, uh, you know, anyone who has their own security detail, uh, you got to be prepared, be set up figure out uh, ahead of time, you might want to hire a stand in a person who's the same height, same complexion, same color of hair, etc. And do all your lighting and prep and you want to minimize the amount of time that person has to be in front of the camera on the set. So you want to be ready to go rehearsed, everything, everything's ready to roll, you should be ready to roll when that person walks into the room. So, um, but you also have to be prepared for change, because if, especially if you're working on women stars of a certain age, they may have their own way of lighting. They may have they may bring along their own gaffer. They may, uh, of course, many of them bring along their own makeup and hair people. And you, as Alex said, you have to be prepared for that. And you have to put it into your budget because their makeup and hair people make usually sometimes two to three times union scale of your regular makeup and hair person. So you have to make sure your budget accommodates having to pay their own hair and makeup person while they're on the set. And you have to be prepared. A lot of actresses know which side of their face to feature and know which side they have to be keyed from, key light on. And if you've chosen the wrong side, you have to be ready to change. So it's a good idea to set up dual key lights on both sides and crank one down for Phil and the other one up for, for a key. And if they come in and said, oh, no, no, you can't key me from the left. You never key me from the left. You just go, Whoop. okay, now we're keyed from the right. You don't want to be there tearing down a whole key light set up on the left and set it up with the key light set up on the right when you suddenly discover that they always like to be keyed from the opposite side. If you're using a teleprompter, um, I use, uh, I do a little trick that uh, I make sure their script is in there and ready to go, of course, but I take a feed from the digital imaging technician and make sure it's color balanced correctly for a high definition video output. And I have a switch so I can switch between the teleprompter feed 
and the feed from the taking camera that's behind the teleprompter. So if they want to see what they look like, they can look into the lens and see themselves. This is dangerous because that's when they may say, oh, you got to move the light to the other side. Uh, and and uh, uh, you give them a look at, at how they, they always want to know how they look. And usually you will have to videotape some of them and play it back for them. But this way it gives them a look and it gives them the confidence that they look as they like to look before it's starting to, to scroll the teleprompter, then switch back to the teleprompter, of course, for the, uh, for the time itself. Uh, let's see, I think I covered most of it the, that hasn't been covered. Like I said, you, you want to treat them uh, as Bill said, like a human being, uh, but you don't never try and take a selfie with a person, never try and ask them for an autograph. That's very unprofessional. Uh, so you want to make sure that you treat them like a human being, but don't treat them like, uh, like you're a fanboy. So be careful about that stuff. Good point. Good point. Nigel? Yes, yeah, so I'll approach this less from the famous people and more from the, the rich or the CEOs and the business people. And I would tell you, don't assume they're all the same. They are all completely different. And the better you get to know the team, the better you'll get to know them. I've had some people that, you know, want to be left alone in the corner. I've had Steve Forbes at events. Steve Forbes gets his lunch and goes and sits at any table he wants to and talks to anyone. So don't, which of course is another challenge sometimes, but don't assume they're all the same. They are all uh, very different. By the way, first generation wealthy typically are much nicer and second or third generation wealthy. So you, you'll find out from their team of what they're like. Again, everything that people have said about uh, using their time, it's much more valuable than yours. Be much more sensitive to it. Be prepared, do walkthroughs, anticipate their needs. Um, I'll tell you one other thing about dealing with very, very senior CEOs and execs like that. Someone gave me a piece of advice once that, that these most senior people generally have four or five things on their mind at any one time. They're all different. You do not want to be one of them. So do not put yourself in that top list of five because life will become miserable for you. The best you can do is get in and out as quickly as you can, use their team, and don't interrupt them. Yeah, the don't interrupt them part. Alex? Yeah, the, the, uh, to, to, Nigel, to Nigel's point, just because they're nice to you when you're doing it, you may think that everything went fine, and then you get an, you know, then someone calls you later. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so they're, they're, most of the exec, most executives are not going to make a scene. They don't want it to be recorded. They don't want to be seen yelling. They don't want to be, so they will be nice to you. Many of them uh, will be nice to you um, the whole time. And then, and then the, it's the call from the executive assistant later um, that, that is rougher than, than, the, than the original one. So um, yeah, definitely be careful of that. Also, the stand-in is super important. Almost every event we do now with any kind of VIPs or anybody who's, uh, that we're working with that we want it to look good and sound good, we use stand-ins and we, that's part of our budget. Um, you know, up to, you know, we had one last week, we had nine stand-ins you know, that, that because, you know, and, and we do all the blocking. We figure out how they're going to walk out, how they're going to do their, you know, and that's not just for them to know, but it's to, for the moderator to understand how it's going to work, for our camera operators to figure out what they're going to need to do with their cameras for the audio engineer. To, so we try to tune all that up and we might spend hours on that for something that maybe, maybe takes, you know, a couple minutes or maybe even two minutes to do in the show. There might be two or three hours of rehearsal to get it just right um, to make sure they're taken care of. And for, as far as the standards go for VIPs, yeah, we try to match them. We had a, uh, we did a couple of uh, uh, events with um, pre uh, president, then president Obama, and um, we had Frederick Van Johnson, who's known as a podcaster, uh, but he, he happens to be a very, uh, very similar build um, and, and, and complexion to Obama. And we called him the, the faux po, the, the faux, the faux potus. So we, 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 he would, I would just text him and just go, we need another faux po. And we schedule him in. It's nice when they can actually answer the questions. Uh, one of the things about Frederick Van Johnson is that he could actually answer the questions as that were pretty believable as the president. So when we're practicing with all the other people that are going to be around, um, it feels as real as possible. That's what you're really looking for. So we really do look for actors for a lot of these things to try to make it as real as we can. Um, because the more real it is, the closer it is to the real thing, the, the more our team gets settled into what it's going to take to do it. And then when the VIP shows up, we can just, it, they're the only one that this is new for. <laughs> That's what you really want. You don't want to be fom fumbling around in front of any VIPs. So you want your team to be totally tied down and totally understand everything that's going to need to be done before they show up. 
And pulling in a comment from the chat, John Snyder says, for you, the high profile guest is everything. For them, you are just one more thing. Act accordingly. And also to add to the conversation, and while we've talked about CEOs, executives, as people are continuing to build their brand, this also pulls in people that might be researchers. So they're really well known in in their space. So they're VIP in that space. And that this the event production, the the speaking could be new. So that's also, you know, just making sure that you're treating them with care, but then also bringing them, them into this um, this world and how you handle digital world and handling them um, with care. Bill? All those things. I, I, I was on a circumstance once and I was working with the president of one company and then uh, they were talking about merging with another company. So we had the president of that company. And afterwards, the PR person sidled up to me and said, I wonder what the burn rate is. And I said, what burn rate? He said, just take the salaries of these two gentlemen, add them together and divide it by the amount of time you've had them. Wonder what that hourly cost is. And so I actually looked it up in public and it was frightening. The uh, the the pure <laughs> amount of resource to just have those two people standing around waiting 10 minutes for a shot was scary. So you just have to pay attention to that. And that's why we always talk about pre preparation, be prepared, get your act together. Don't be sitting there sending somebody out for 20 minutes to get a battery because you forgot to bring one. Because with these two people uh, sitting in front of you, that could cost you half a million dollars in extreme circumstances. All right, let's get into these questions. The first one comes from Stephen Kimber in Berkeley, California. He says, how to best positively engage with the security team so that they're comfortable with you and the event. As part of that, it is understanding the demarcation zone around the talent. Go ahead, John. It's really about just establishing good um, methods of communication, understanding how you, they want to use the uh, comms with you and your team. Um, we've done a couple high profile events this past year, and it's working a lot with um, regional law enforcement as well, making sure that they have an understanding, a place to set up, place to be comfortable, make sure there's coffee, donuts, water. Uh, those guys are your friends. They're really going to help push the event through smoothly, and they can definitely make things difficult for you if, if they don't feel comfortable with uh, the person they're hired to protect. Courtney? Yeah, if they're traveling with a security team of their own, especially Secret Service, be prepared, as Alex said, to have to leave the room because they will generally lock everybody out of the room. They will bring in the bomb sniffing dogs, believe it or not, who will have their free reign of the area where the uh, uh, celebrity or uh, politician will be to make sure that uh, everything is secure and then they will let you back in. So if you're planning on trying to keep something to do to the last minute, be prepared for the fact that you may be locked away from your equipment for 10 or 15 minutes or so while they do a, a security sweep. Uh, so that's one of the problems with security. And, uh, and like they said, you got to treat, uh, you got to interface with the, their head of security and find out what the perimeters are. Another thing you want to do is make sure there's no one in their eye line. If they're supposed to be looking at the camera or looking at an interviewer, make sure there's no one standing behind the interviewer. And if you have a camera over the shoulder of the interviewer, you want to drape it in black and maybe have make sure it's your camera operators are dressed in black and maybe wearing black masks these days in COVID days so that they kind of blend into the background because you don't want the, the talent or the uh, person on camera distracted by someone moving in the background. Go ahead, Nigel. Most high people and high profile people I've met view their staff as a proxy for them. And if you miss, if you treat them badly, you it's like you're treating the high profile person badly. So I don't care if they're securities, assistants, secretaries, whatever it is, Treat them like they're the high profile. Show maximum respect. Be very flexible. It's like you're dealing with the person themselves. And if you do that, everything will work out fine. Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, to one of the things that Courtney's point, we try to mask, we, we try to encase anybody, especially if they're going to be like on a remote. If there's a camera there, even trying to block them, being able to see the camera operator is usually what we try to do. You know, usually because of the way we use in Teratron, they don't, you know, someone's behind a teleprompter, so it's hard to see them anyway. Um, but we try to, uh, we, we use uh, pipe and drape around everything. It, it also cuts down on any kind of reflection, but it also makes sure that they can stay focused on who they're talking about if they're in that kind of environment. Um, the thing that I think a lot of people 
underestimate is the value of green rooms, you know, and multiple green rooms and rooms that allow them to calm down. Um, they want to make sure there's a couple things that we think about with a, with, they need to be able to see the show. So the green room needs to have uh, a monitor in it where they can see what's actually happening. They need um, power, uh, power for their devices, power for their, um, the, possibly their laptops. And so we usually have tables and even for temporary ones, we will drill a hole in the table. You make these little ones that drop into tables and you just take a, it's a two inch drill and you just drill straight in or two third, two and three quarters, whatever. But anyway, you, you just drill a hole through it and drop it down into it. Um, and it's got USB and, and, uh, and power, you know, in it, um, that we, that we usually put in the wall, in the, make it look nice. Um, they, you know, generally soft lighting that makes them feel calm. You may put, you may end up putting a, um, you want to find out what kind of food and that's going to be typically a refrigerator for them. Um, this is the, when we're dealing with really high profile folks. And then you also want to think about, um, the, uh, you want to think about like what they need, the makeup table, the couch that they're going to sit on, a chair that they can work on, where are they going to put their laptop when they if, they, if they have to do something with a laptop, where is that going to go and how are they going to sit? Are they going to put it on their lap? Are they going to, is there going to be a little desk, desk for them if they need to do that? And what, what's the comfort of that chair? Um, are flowers going to improve it or are they allergic to something? Do you need to pay attention to that? Um, what is the, what, how far do they have to walk and who do they have to walk in front of to get to the restroom? You know, these are the kind of things that, that they, you know, how are they going to enter the building and can that be done privately and securely? And so those are all, and now if you're working with a big security team, they'll know that, <laughs> but, but if you're doing it, you need to think about that. The other thing, and generally for instance, for a high profile individual, if they're using a bathroom, they're the only ones using that bathroom. Like, you know, like literally there's, you know, there, you know, that's, that's the, that, that's their bathroom, <laughs> not everybody's bathroom. Um, and the, the final thing is, is that, you know, not on the final thing, but, um, but you really, uh, you, you really want to think through all of these things and, and understand that, that it's not just about providing them, it's providing them with class and style, you know, um, that you, that they come in and they feel that that mess has them feel like this is important, that, that, that people paid attention to those little details and that they, and they feel like, okay, this is, you know, and it gets them in the right state to be the best talent for your show. And so, you know, I think a lot of people put them, put people, I, I watch, other, you know, we, we spend a lot of time on this, you know, and when we, you go back behind a, like a big stage, like Dreamforce, you see four or five rooms, just like what I discussed that are temporary, that were all set up for different VIPs that are going to speak. Not one big one, not a place where they have a coffee urn or something that's out there. Um, it is all, they're all very, um, and they've, they have people that are dressed really well, that are bringing food and coffee and cappuccinos and all those other things. And, and people who figure out how to do all of that are the ones that get called back, you know, like th that, that's the team because there's not a lot of teams that do that well. And so it, it, when you do that really, really well, it seems like an, a, uh, an extra budget, but it's, it's worth every penny. Yeah. To your point there, Alex, too, of like just the people that are around them dress well, because these folks know that there are cameras going off at any second and how that impacts their, you know, their brand. And then also whoever the handlers are on your team, maybe they look a little bit different as well. And what I mean, that could be a blazer or the, the colors they're wearing so that it, they're easily um, identifiable. And going back to the question of just how do you make it like positively engage with their security team over communicate, like having those blueprints in advance. Think of this, think of working with security as like pre-production with security yeah, and all. And, yeah. And move slowly and ask for permission. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, like, like those, are, those are big, like, can I go here? Can I go here? Is this okay? Um, is it okay if I pick this up? Um, those types of things. Uh, and, and also just no sudden, like what security really doesn't like is for multiple people to do something that, that they didn't expect um, at the same time quickly is usually a way to get a really kinetic reaction out of a security um, detail because that's, that's, that's usually a precursor to bad things happening. And so um, the other thing to know is that if you're dealing with a, um, a head of state, they will want two points of egress, minimum of 33 inches wide typically, um, uh, for every room that that individual is going into. So you can't take them, you can't plan for to put them into a room with only one door. So just think about that. Too. Yeah, that was my mapping out, whether, the, whether it be the route coming in, I think it's but then what inches, are those, not 33, but yeah, 30 inches, whatever those inches. back, back rooms are. And those, you're going to ask, but you have to be very careful yeah. about that. Like they, they really won't want two points. They always want two points. And, uh, yeah. And Courtney. Yeah, one thing we didn't mention is photography. Uh, make sure that um, 
you check with their head of security uh, to if you have a still photographer that's hired by you, who's supposed to be working on the set to take behind the scenes photos or something, make sure you clear that ahead of time because a lot of celebrities or uh, you know high profile politicians do not allow photography that is that they don't have control over. So um, you may have to clear ahead of time if you have a still photographer to make sure that all of the photographs taken are run through their people. Uh, and it is generally a best 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 practice to make sure that there are no cell phones on the set, nobody's videotaping uh, with their cell phone, or anything like that, because uh, uh, you could get in a lot of trouble or shut the set down if someone pulls out a phone and tries to videotape something behind the scenes, and you don't have permission to do that. Yeah, that's a, a great point there too, um, Courtney, of just even because there are teams that we've worked on their team for and just what we receive is that exact thing of like no cameras, no recording, like all those elements and just making sure that even if you're pulling in other teams to support you, that you've thoroughly spoken um, over those um, steps with the team as well. And, and the other thing is, is control of information. I just want to yes. just throw that in there is not everybody needs to know everything, you know, Think about every person on your team and what do they need to do, know to execute their show? Not what do they want to know, not what do they think they need to know, but from your perspective, what do they need to know? The, the camera operators need to know where the stage is and they need to know who's important to pay attention to and, and so on and so forth. But they don't need to know their travel schedule. They don't need to know the sad information. They don't need to know. You know they don't need to know all that stuff. They just need to know when to show up who are the important people that they have to pay attention to, who are the, you know, those types of things. But I think sometimes people overshare. And so you just want to be very careful of, of giving people like, there's a lot of events that we've worked on that are very high profile and very secure. And we, our team has gotten the, our, the, the team that we work with, the people, the freelancers that we work with have gotten used to the fact that they will be told, Hey, we have an event on these days. Can you make it? We're not going to tell you anything about the event until you, until you say yes. Like if you if you don't say yes, I'm not going to tell you what, what I'm not going to give you any information about it. And if you say, yes, I'm available on those days. Then we tell you where it is. Oftentimes we've had ones where we don't tell you where it's going to be until you land. Like, you know, like, you know, you're, you're, you know, until you get on the, at the airport, you'll get more information about where you need to go. Um, because we can't have anybody show up there. We can't have anything leak out. We can't have any, you know, those types of things. And so, um, you really want to think about the absolute, you know, uh, you know, you don't want to go too short where people aren't going to have the information they need to operate, but you don't need to give them all the information about the show. Go ahead, Bill. Just one time, the other little thing on sets, it's also good to do limited but clear introductions of who might be interacting with them. So if I have an executive on set, I will make it a point to go, if I don't know the person, I'm the director here, and this is Tom, he's doing uh, audio, he's our A1, so he might be adjusting your lab, and this is uh, Jane, she's doing makeup. So if those people approach them, they at least know who they are, make it short and sweet, but the ones who might interact with them, I want them to know that they're kind of approved. And, and then the last thing is, if you have any questions, just ask me directly and we'll figure it out. So they know who to go to, so they don't have to think about who's wandering around. Next question. Next question comes to us from Alex Knight in Vancouver. How do you approach booking higher profile guests through management when they have limited time and don't want to drive out to the studio or even allow enough time for setup and mic tests on location? Alex, I'll let you start because you might give more context to this and then we'll yeah, go to thank you. Yeah. So I, I had a, a comedian that was uh, in town for a tour and they only had 30 minutes. Uh, I was talking to their uh, management and we were trying to, and originally they had planned to drive out and come into the studio, but they realized they didn't have enough time. So I was trying to figure out, well, okay, I'll come, I'll come to the hotel. Uh, they, they offered to do it some, somewhere in the hotel lobby, but I had know issues with noise and stuff like that so then we kind of worked it to okay well let's do it in the hotel room but i wanted at least a couple of hours to set up because we're dealing with multi multiple cameras lighting need time to uh, do mic checks and all that sort of thing and they said well we don't have any time for that we literally want to walk into a room have him sit down and i said well that's not going to work uh, you're, you're not going to look and sound good i can't guarantee it so it was unfortunate because that guess would have been really good for my client's podcast but uh, I just didn't want to, uh, it wasn't going to work. So that's always a tough one. I'll let you go ahead, my Nigel. Yeah. So I think what you have to do is consider what's in it for the guest, what's in it for the high profile person. You've got to ask yourself, why would they come to your event? What's in it for them? 
And then if you can't articulate that, if it's just good for you and not good for them, you're already heading down a bad path. If they're, if they're somebody like a CEO or someone like that, they have an assistant, they have an executive assistant, they may have a chief of staff, all of those people can help you answer that question. I have to tell you, I once sent an airplane from um, Palm Beach to, uh, Cal, uh, to Northern Cal to pick up somebody to do an hour's presentation and f then fly them back again. By the way, the most arrogant person I'd ever met, but that's not important here. Um, and we could have a competition about that. But I actually put somebody on the plane to brief them, to get them ready so they could walk off the plane into a car, into the hall and present. And that's, that's what you have to do, but you have to make it sure it's worth their time because otherwise if they're doing you a favor, that will quickly perish. Alex? Yeah, the, the, um, this gets back into stand-ins and setups and so on and so forth, the thinking, thinking about exactly what we need. So if someone says they're going to just walk in, we've definitely had lots of people that we don't get access to until a minute before the event. Like it's like literally they're going to walk in and now if they're going to sit down for a podcast, we're going to have the mic set up. We're going to have someone who had walked and talked and thought about it. It's not going to be something we, we try to avoid attaching things to them. Um, you know, a lot of the other thing you have to notice is, know is what are the sensitivities? There's some people that do not like to be touched, you know, by especially by somebody that they don't know or they don't like to be fiddled with. So it means that you have to put the mic on really fast and sometimes not as clean as you'd like. Sometimes we move to a handheld mic for them so that they don't have to think about that. Um, and so those are other things that we've, we've done. But definitely... Again, we have stand-ins that sit in for that that person and be that person. Um, we try to minimize the things like, so if they're going to sit down in a, uh, in a on a Zoom, we want to use a shotgun mic. We need to know whether we can put something in their ear. We need to know if we, or if we have to use a speaker. Um, and the speaker plus shotgun mic is something that we, we know how to do. Um, but that allows them just to sit down and start talking. Um, but we you, you definitely want to be able to build something where, you have you, it's just more work on your end to set up everything so that someone can just walk in and that's what they're expecting you to do more work on your end not on theirs <laughs> so so they're gonna they're gonna show up and and but a lot of times we've had them literally sit down uh we pat them down a little bit for for shine and we go you know like and and but we have to make sure that everything on our end has been tested and again put somebody in there to be them until they're until they're there and just troubleshooting for the future, just curious as to like Nigel's point, was there a po an opportunity to maybe have someone on your team, again, more work, um, but someone on your team to go to their site to to mic check for whatever, you know how important this, um, this interview was or would be um, just for the future because of how people, um, ultimately how people view their time. And as Nigel said, the what's in it for them, um, building that up in a way that they would be interested, you know, in that time. We've had times where our, we've, we've sent someone on site to, even if it's just testing something as minuscule um, as possible. And just to, to that point really quickly, um, that if we, one of the things that we do a lot is we, people say, oh, it's going to be easier if, if that VIP just comes in from their house by themselves on their own. And it's not really because we needed to test, we need to set up, we need to do a lot of other things, we need to make sure that it's working, we need to, that's the stuff that becomes really complicated. So a lot of times, that's where we really demand, I got to be able to put somebody on the ground, and it can be in their house, <laughs> or, or I need their executive assistant to be available for the four hours that we need to do testing and prep and everything else. But I needed that all to kind of be in place to, to make that happen. Um, because then it's actually easier for them, because they're just going to walk into a room and be themselves. Um, but you have to be able to then put a team in to do that. And that can be a disruption, but oftentimes them by themselves in their house is not, a, is not more, less disruption. It's more disruption for them. Uh, it's and higher risk for them to look really bad in front of a lot of people. Alex. Yeah. I mean, so it's a learning opportunity for me because this is the first time I've tried to do that and I don't have a team. It's just me and also my client. I mean, his show has next to no audience. It was more of this comedian was... Uh, he's kind of a, an emerging artist and he was really doing us a favor, but also my client doesn't really have a budget and I was really willing to go down there to the hotel and do it for free. But of course, the client also just didn't want to allow me access to the hotel room to do the setup. So it sounds like it was just like a confluence of all this, all these things that were going to lead to it not working really. 
And sometimes that's, you know, sometimes that's the case. But when you can, no matter what level the the talent is at, it, when you can provide that VIP to get what you need, then just thinking outside the box is also, um, that would be helpful. But thanks for sharing your learning lesson with us. And Bill. Yeah, also know when to call an audible. I did a circumstance. I was in the brand new Bank One ballpark, beautiful dome stadium, and we got lucky. And uh, one of the most popular players, a really handsome young guy, uh, was going to be our interviewee. And so I brought in Track and Dolly, and I had both Lav and Boom, and I was all set. And when the guy showed up, he sat down and he said, you got 10 minutes. And I started the first part of the first shot, and I thought, this is not going to work. And I turned to everybody and said, lock it down. It's a static shot now because that's all we're going to have the time to execute. So no matter what you thought it was going to be in the face of somebody who is high profile is giving you a limited amount of time. Sometimes you just have to get the best you can get done under the limitations. You're so you don't fight for that cool dolly shot that I really wanted and had spent all that time and effort to set up for lock it down. Being adaptable and willing to change. Next question. Craig McFarlane in Boston, Massachusetts. Are there ways to internally know, note or track the particular sensitivities of individuals, or is it just a small team's memories? Go ahead, Courtney. Not too sure what the question is going for, but if you're talking about the sensitivities of the talent that you need to be prepared for, it's a good idea if you've never worked with a celebrity, let's say before, is to either talk to the personal assistant for that celebrity ahead of time, or better yet, Talk to other people that have worked with that celebrity in a situation such as the one you're you're set up for to find out if they, well, you know, you don't want to shoot Orson Welles after lunch because, you know, he gets a little bit tipsy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you want to get all your close-ups and dialogue shot in the morning and all your wide establishing shots in the afternoon, et cetera. So you, if you know uh, the pr proclivity of a, of a certain talent, uh, you have to accommodate that and you want to make sure that you have a single line of communication between that talent. So you only, you don't, as Alex pointed out earlier, you don't want multiple people telling the talent different things. Uh, you want the director mainly to be the only person talking to the talent. Uh, and as little as possible uh, or as little as necessary to get the delivery that they want to get. Uh, and like I said, it's best to talk to other people that have worked with that talent to, to learn their little picadillos. If, you know, if they get upset by anyone just staring at them, you got to be careful about that. There, a lot of times you work with a celebrity, you'll get a list from the uh, handler or from their personal assistant that tells you, you know, don't ask for any autographs. Don't look directly at Mr. So-and-so. Don't, uh, uh, you know, don't take any selfies. Make sure you don't know recording devices are used. Uh, they'll give you all the do's and don'ts before they arrive on the set. And uh, you can, you know, keep that in your uh, <laughs> database for whenever you're working with that celebrity so that you have those available next time you work with them, if there is a next time, if you obeyed all the little piccadillas. If you made it through, made it through the next time. Alex? Yeah, and be careful. That's another thing that you keep to a handful of people, like what what the information is that that is necessary. Um, you know, oftentimes we keep pretty detailed under, understanding of different uh, folks that we've worked with and what their requirements are and what their their things that bother them, things that they're more likely to be bothered by. Um, it's not something we publish somewhere <laughs> internally. There's not like an internal doc. Um, and and it is something that you can oftentimes, that some comes with experience that is is there. Um, to Courtney's point that came up while you we were, we were talking that, that it reminded me of is that sometimes your members of your team will feel like this is their one chance to, you know, to put a script in front of somebody or to tell them how the a great idea for their company. Um, yeah, good ideas are not something that is usually um, excited. <laughs> they're excited to hear when they're getting ready for a show. So, you know, you really need to keep it to the minimum number of, you know, you want to be conversational where it makes sense, but but generally you put people in front of folks that are going to have as little conversation as, as possible. And just pulling in John's comment in the in the chat for small orgs, a simple spreadsheet would work. If you already use a CRM, you can track it there. Nigel? Uh, it may seem like a stupid thing to say, but don't leave people's phone numbers around. I've seen people, you know, leave uh, talents phone numbers on scripts or, or stuff like that. You just, you know, again, need to know. Yeah. And Alex? 
and just make sure I, I this is a mistake that I made make um <laughs> I'm sorry, make, make sure that, that every person has, no matter how simple the job is, every person really knows how to do that job. Um, we were at Davos and we had um, an actress come in, this very high profile actress and from uh, English and very, very, very sweet. But um, I, I had somebody that I thought, well, I just put the D shine on, you know, the, the, um, the mat, mattify. And I just, I thought he had done it before. He hadn't done it before. And uh, I said, I thought it'd be fun for him to be able to put that on onto the actress. I thought that that would be fine. And um, he uh, he put it on and he put it on the sponge sideways, you know, the little sponge that you use. He put it on the side part of it and he's kind of, he's getting it done, but it wasn't, it wasn't a pretty, you know, pretty approach to it. And she asked, just looked at him and asked, is this your area of strength? <laughs> <laughs> Which was the nicest way of saying. I don't think Oops. you've ever done this before, <laughs> so, but but, but we, it, it did become an internal joke of the company. Anytime someone says, "Is this your area of strength?" and of course he he said the proper thing, which was yes. <laughs> and we never. I, I took over from then on. Like that was the. I I, I did all the D shine for the rest of the week. <laughs> Hilarious. Anyway. Next question. John Snyder in Reno, Nevada. How do you treat contingency and or backup plans differently with a high profile guest? Go ahead, Nigel. So we always try and do a paper walkthrough of anything we're going to do, which is we sit around and we walk through the event as if it was real or we do it on paper. When we have a particular high profile event, we then move, tend to move into an extended what if such session is we really try and do what ifs no idea is too stupid well maybe some but mostly no ideas are too stupid and you really want to do what if they don't turn up what if they this what if they that because you can't be over prepared but you can easily be under prepared very true courtney and if you're doing and i learned this a long time ago uh, and i was really amazed uh, having worked on film sets for many years that how live television a lot of time isn't prepared and i was doing a live show a live network show satellite show from a location out in the open we got there the day before set up the stage wired everything there was no cover for the stage it was outdoors and uh, there were no contingencies for a giant rainstorm head again which actually happened about 10 minutes before the show was to go live. And they hadn't made, you know, I was going, well, well don't you have pop-ups or do you, don't you have a cover for the stage? You know, uh, well, we'll give them umbrellas. Yeah, that's going to look great. Uh, so uh, make sure that you have the contingencies for the weather. Uh, and don't think that, well, it's supposed to be sunny that, you know, something, a big cloud could come up at the last minute or a windstorm can blow over your lighting equipment. Uh, so you got to be prepared to handle, you know, inclement weather at all times because that's variable and you can't necessarily predict it accurate. Alex? Yeah, there's lots of contingencies that we have to worry about and, and figure those things out. For the high profile guests, one of the big things that we worry about is their microphone. Um, and, and so we usually have... Um, a backup handheld wireless and oftentimes a backup wired mic, you know, for high profile folks just to make sure if something happens. So, for instance, if you're dealing with someone with head of states, particularly United States, um, none of the cell, I mean, only a handful of wireless systems like Axiant will work um, in that environment. So if they have something only one step below that. Uh, oftentimes you're going to see issues uh, and and possibly no transmission at all. So you have to be kind of uh, conscious to um, those types of things and make sure that you're ready for for those things. The handheld is because they may walk on and suddenly there's not enough time to properly put on a on a lav. And at that point, you're just going to hand them a handheld to, to have them use that. So those are the kind of things that we worry about, uh, making sure that you just really understand what's most important to get them on stage if something got uh, moved over. And then, of course, working with if they're a high profile working with their security or what egress is, if there's a, some kind of uh, kinetic event, um, there's also, if they're not, then you want to know what that is. Um, and then finally with high profile vests, uh, guests do bring high profile uh, risks. Um, usually we had a safe word that meant just walk away. You know, like, so like, you know, like for our, our if we say that over and we, we kept it very secret, like we wouldn't use it now, but we, we used to say, if, if we say super six, four, Super six four meant leave. Like, don't ask me. Don't say what did you say. Don't you know, just get up and go. And we would say it three times. You know, if we if we did that, and we off, we would warn everybody that if that comes over the thing, it means that there's a, um, a, a there's an issue that is everyone's that puts people at risk. 
And we would usually talk about where people go and usually is not where everybody else is going <laughs> because that's, you know, that was the, and so we would, we would have a, a different, a different route than what, what everyone else is going to do. So. And I would say just making sure that you know who you're not only just client facing, but those people on your team that crisis and that I just stress that crisis that they'll they'll be able to navigate like they know where to go they know who to speak to they they can quickly and empower them to make decisions um case in oh Alice yeah no no go, go, go ahead oh um case in point there was uh, a tech event that we were working on and someone who was not on not a speaker not on the show they showed up and they wanted to try to get in and that, you know, you can't, you can't plan for that, but high profile events bring high profile people. And then we had to pull someone from our team who was already handling with someone, but we knew that they would be the best person to deal with that. And they had to go out, find them, bring them, bring, none of that was, you know, in our plan. So just making sure that the, you have those people pinpointed on your team that can just handle crisis really well. Alex. Yeah. The, um, the, that's going to be something that someone generally isn't going to learn. Like, so the people who are able to be calm and, and to give people clear vision is, is, is somewhat of a learned thing, but oftentimes it's a personality. And so you just want to look at those things that they can be calm. If people have a tendency to get edgy, have a tendency to get nervous. Um, it's not just, they're just probably not the person to put in that position. You know, you want to put them in a place that, that they can succeed. And to Liberty's point, when you have someone who comes in, who's a, who, potentially really wants to talk to the person in a way that you don't think is going to really work for the show. What we usually do is say, Hey, we, we, I think we can probably, I think we can get you a, 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 an audience with them after right afterwards. And you can just have a one-on-one -on -one and discuss what your issues are and we get them into a room. And then we come back later and say, Oh, I'm sorry, we couldn't make that work. <laughs> so, so it's just, you know, like we just stick them in a room and let them sit there and watch the show and, um, and then, and then come back and say, sorry, we just weren't able to make that work. And then we let them go. Um, you know, that's, it's not appropriate for them to do that there. And, um, and I'm not, I don't really feel bad about it. <laughs> and, and we've had occasionally we've had the, the VIP say, Hey, I really want to talk to that person. So it's not that we don't, we don't, it's not that we don't bring it up or we just dump them into a room. It's that we bring up to their team. There's someone who really wants to talk to them. This is who it is. What do you want to do? And you know, 90% of the time they say no, you know, 99% say no, but if they say yes, it's that, that we, we, we set up a, a system for them to do that. Next question. Next question comes to us from Chris Widener in Lafayette, Indiana. And Chris says, are NDAs and non-disclosure agreements and having to submit info for background checks common when dealing with talent? Do you charge more for lifetime NDAs versus time limited? And Alex? Uh, NDAs are kind of par for the course. And if you start charging differently for a lifetime versus a, 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 um, a time limited, people won't call back. They just expect and, you to sign it. And Courtney? And there are different rules in different states uh, because laws are different in different states and NDAs may be illegal uh, past a certain, you know, they, they can't be forever and ever in some states and they can be in other states. So you got to make sure, you know, you abide by state law and um, you'll run into it, especially if you're doing uh, product photography or something about a new item that's going to be released, they will be you know, the Apple's NDAs were the worst. You couldn't bring out a new product unless it was surrounded on four sides by 30 foot high black curtains. Uh, so they couldn't be seen from anything outside the black curtain. And you couldn't even tell anybody in the NDA that you were working on one of their shoots, who you were shooting for, where you were shooting or when you were shooting. Uh, so not only could you not reveal anything about the contents of what you were shooting, you couldn't even mention the fact that you were even working on it. And Nigel? Our NDAs are not written by accident. They're not written for fun. If you debate our NDA with us, you probably won't go further forward. Well said. And our next question. Harshi Trividi here in the panel, Daytona Beach, Florida. What have been your experiences with talent that may have other abilities? How did you compensate for these needs? Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, this is where we either work with them or their or their staff to figure out how do they usually do this and what do they need and 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 what is the egress and how are they going to get there and how do we make sure that that's all working? Um, you know, so if someone might be uh, have some mobi mobi mobility challenges, then we look for where, what does that mean and what do we have to open up? And we usually will specialize a um, 
uh, an elevator if they have, you know, site issues? How do they normally interact with folks and what, what, what can we do? And sometimes that's a position of their chair. That's the kind of lighting that we give them. Um, it's understanding whether they need a wireless IFB or some kind of IFB that they can get instructions or descriptions. So those are all, you know, but definitely if someone has um, some specific needs, uh, then we pay like everything else, pay very, very close attention to them, make sure that there is a person accountable for that and make sure that, that it's considered one of the highest priorities uh, in our productions is to make sure that anybody who has a special need um, gets exactly what they need to, to be successful. Go ahead, Courtney. And if you're interviewing someone who's a musician or a performer uh, who plays a certain musical instrument, you might want to have a musical instrument handy for them during the interview. If they play the piano or if they're a composer, they might feel more comfortable sitting at a piano so they can demonstrate something they're talking about uh, uh, during that conversation. So make sure you're, uh, you find that out in advance, have a piano there for them and make sure it's tuned. I think, the, and, and the overall lesson is everybody has special needs. <laughs> like everybody has special needs. And, and when we're dealing with high profile individuals, we just have to know what those are. And Hashid. I just wanted to add one quick tip for anybody that you might involve let's say, with blindness. Just always offer your elbow because that is a better position of walking with somebody rather than you yanking a person or trying to grab them. Even though it's high profile or low profile, doesn't make a difference. It's always to offer your elbow because that is a form of uh, giving guidance. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. And thank you to our producers for another great show, for your questions, for your comments, um, going back and forth and sharing with each other. Thank you to our panelists for sharing your expertise and insights. And of course, our back end team that ensures that we look and sound great and that we are able to bring you this show each and every day. And again, if you want to learn more about what we do here, head over to officehours.global and we're going to head into after hours. We'll see you again soon. Bye. And the whispering begins. 71,000 miles. Oh. We covered 71,000 miles. 114. Right on, I'm green. I'm green room. Yes. <laughs> awesome. It's not, we didn't get, we didn't get the, a 1K status today, but you know. There's always tomorrow, always tomorrow. Tomorrow is another day. It turns out it is. It's only a day away. <laughs> it's just like today, only like